Good afternoon. Um, I have already learned so much from the visit of His Eminence because this is the first time I've ever been at an event at Harvard that is starting on time. And uh, we have our, our wonderful friends from Nigeria to thank for that. Um, I'm Anne Browdy, and I'm the director of the Women's Studies and Religion program here at Harvard Divinity School. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the first public event marking the visit of His Eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, to Harvard University. Your Eminence, it is an honor to have you with us. Your visit has inspired us to bring together a distinguished panel of scholars to address an issue on which you have spoken most eloquently, the education of women and girls in an Islamic context. For 30 years, Harvard's Women's Studies in Religion program has tried to shed light on what difference it makes for the world when women control the tools of religious literacy and religious knowledge. Little did we know when this program was founded 30 years ago that we had an extraordinary role model in a woman who lived in West Africa 200 years ago. A woman renowned for her scholarship, for her poetry, and for her lifelong commitment to women's education. A woman who played an important role in the success of the Sokoto Caliphate. That woman was Nana Asmao, a daughter of the Caliphate's founder, Don Fodio, whose family would also eventually produce the current sultan who is here with us today. We have assembled a panel of scholars who will help us both to look backward to learn from the past and the model of Nana Asmao, and to look forward to think about the meaning of her legacy for today and for the future. The education of girls and women is one of the most critical issues facing the world today. We know that every year a girl stays in school increases her chances of leading a healthy life, of raising healthy children, and of contributing to her society. And we know that religion has been used by some to discourage or deny that education. All of our panelists have worked hard to bring Islamic perspectives supporting women's education to the fore. They represent diverse approaches to the topic, and we look forward to a lively discussion among them and with the audience. I've asked each speaker to speak for about 12 minutes in order to allow time for discussion and I will be sitting right next to them to remind them if they forget the time. Um, and I, I want to pause for just a moment before I introduce today's panel to thank the dozens of people, both at the Divinity School and throughout the university and in Nigeria who worked so hard to make this visit a reality. Um, I cannot possibly acknowledge even a fraction of those who have labored for this day, but I do want to take this opportunity to thank my two colleagues, Hawa Ibrahim and Jacob Alupana, who introduced me to Nana Asmao and who are really responsible for the Sultan's presence here today. Thank you to our, Jacob, where are you? Love you. Thank you very much. Jacob and Hawa, thank you. So without further ado, um, let me introduce today's speaker in the order in which they will speak. Um, first, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Beverly Mack, who is Professor of African Studies and Director of the University of Kansas African Studies Center. She has published extensively on African literature and Muslim women's lives in West Africa, including her 1990 book, House of Women in the 20th Century. In collaboration with Jean Boyd, Dr. Mack has become one of the most important biographers and translators of the work of Nana Asmao. She has done an enormous amount to bring the work of Nana Asmao to today's students and scholar. She and Jean Boyd prepared the collected works of Nana Asmao in English, as well as their book, One Woman's Jihad, Nana Asmao, Scholar and Scribe. Jean and Beverly have now completed an additional manuscript 
which we look forward to very much, entitled Asmao's Legacy, the Yan Taru model for women's scholarly activism from the 19th to the 21st centuries, which I hope we'll hear something about if she can squeeze it into her 12 minutes. Um, she has won many awards for her work, including in 2000 selection as one of the 12 National Carnegie Corporation Scholars for Innovative Scholarship in Education, International Development, Democracy, and International Peace and Security. The next speaker will be Usana Alidu. A, she is Distinguished Associate Professor in the Department of African, Middle Eastern, and South Asian Languages and Literature in the program, and the Program in Comparative Literature at Rutgers University, where she is also Director of the African Studies Center. She holds a doctorate in Theoretical Linguistics from Indiana University. Her research focuses mainly on the study of women's discourses and literacy practices in Afro-Islamic societies. Her first book, Engaging Modernity, Muslim Women and the Politics of Agency in Postcolonial Niger, focused on Muslim women's educational initiatives in her native country. After a few other book projects, she has returned to related themes in her new book on East Africa, Reformist Muslim Women and 1990s Democratization processes in Kenya, which appeared this year from the University of Wisconsin Press. After Usaina, we will hear from Mohammed El Sanusi, who is the Director of Communications and Community Outreach for the Islamic Society of North America, which we call ISNA. Is that all right, if we say ISNA? He holds a bachelor degree in Sharia and law from the International Islamic University in Islamabad, Pakistan, a master of law from Indiana University, and a graduate diploma in philanthropic studies from the Indiana University Center on Philanthropy, as well as a PhD in law and society from the Indiana School of Law. At ISNA, his responsibilities include fostering interfaith relations strengthening ISNA's relationships with the Muslim community in North America, and supervising ISNA's joint projects with interfaith organizations and federal government institutions. In addition, Dr. El Sanusi is vice president of the Interfaith Broadcasting Commission and serves on the board of directors and advisors of a number of interfaith organizations, including the Religion Communicators Council, Evangelicals for Human Rights, and the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. Dr. El Sanusi has appeared on CNN, BBC, Sky TV, Al Jazeera, C-SPAN, Al Hura, Al Arabia, Saudi Arabia TV, radio, and other media outlets, so we're glad he could squeeze us in. Thank you for coming. Um, our fourth speaker will be Zainab Alwani, Assistant Professor of Islamic, Islamic Studies at the Howard University School of Divinity. She received her doctorate in Islamic sciences and jurisprudence from the International Islamic University in Malaysia. Since then, she has produced major publications in several areas of Islamic law, all of them focusing on conflict resolution, whether it be conflict resolution within the family or among religious groups. Toward this end, she has worked to develop Quranic models that deal with the contemporary Muslim women's and family issues, including domestic violence and female empowerment in American Muslim communities. Dr. Alwani is the first female jurist to serve on the FIC Council of North America. This council, an affiliate of ISNA, advises and educates its members and officials on matters related to the application of Sharia in their individual and collective lives in North American, in the North American environment. And I'm very happy to report, I think this is still fresh news, that I believe just last week, Dr. Alwani was named Vice President of the Fee Council of North America. Um, finally, the last word on our panel, the Sultan has asked his delegate to represent him and Dr. Myro Mandera will be speaking on his behalf. 
Dr. Mandera is an obstetrician gynecologist um, who did her degrees at the University of Jos and the, took her MD at the West African College of Surgeons where she shortly joined the faculty. She is a founding, a founding member of the Federation of Muslim Women's Associations of Nigeria where she was the pioneer chair of the National Health Committee of that federation. She played a major role in addressing the polio vaccination setback experienced in Nigeria five years ago. She is currently the health advisor in the office of the senior special advisor to the president on Millennium Development Goals in Nigeria. And she works in that capacity as part of her work um, for the Earth Institute at Columbia University, where she works, uh, where, w and I didn't write down the rest of what she told me about that. I only learned she would be speaking this morning, so I'm going to, if there's something else you need to know about her, she's going to have to tell you herself. Um, without further ado, let me ask our first speaker to come to the microphone and begin our panel. Thank you, Dr. Brody. Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Wa marhaba ya sarikin muslimi. I'm very glad to be here for this discussion of Nana Asma'u. Um, as Dr. Brody mentioned, none of this would be possible without Jean Boyd's devoted attention to Nana Asma'u for many decades. And um, she is here with us in spirit, although she's actually in England right now. Um, we could talk about Nana Asma'u all day, but as you heard, time is short, so I have tried to compress this into three talking points. The first has to do with Nana Asma'u's background. She was born in 1793 in Dega, a small village outside of what is now Sokoto, Nigeria, in the northern part of Nigeria. Nana was an honorific, it means lady. She was born into a Fulani, um, clan headed by Shehu Usman Dan Fodio. Fodio in the Fufulde language means learned, and Fufulde is one of four languages that Asma'u spoke. She was trained in her early life by her mother and her grandmother, as was her father, the Shehu, and women and men before them. Among the Fodios, women were expected to learn, to study, and to teach. Asma'u studied a canon of materials from her father's library and from the books that he himself wrote. Many of these manuscripts dated back centuries in Islamic scholarship. She taught both women and men, but she's best known now for her establishment of a program of educational outreach to women, through which she trained a cadre of older women who were by that stage in their lives free to travel to the homes of younger women in the rural areas who were homebound by their childcare obligations. These teachers of women were known as the Yantaru, the associates. Their teacher was called a Jaji. For my second point, we fast forward 125 years after Asma'u's death to the late 20th century. At that time in the US in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in a Qadariya Sufi community that was affiliated with the Fodio legacy. Um, the leader of that community learned of Nana Asma'u's Yantaru plan. He had read the collected works of Nana Asma'u in translation, and he told the women in his community about her Yantaru organization. Soon, these American Muslim women were contacting Jean and me to ask permission to post Asma'u's poems on their new Yantaru website. It included neighborhood social, uh, social activism programs, health information, entrepreneurial opportunities, and of course, it used Asma'u's poems to teach, just as the original Yantaru had done. The word spread. Now there are Kaderiya Sufi communities affiliated with the Fodio community throughout the US. Each one has an active Yantaru group in Oakland, in San Diego, in Houston, in Springfield, Massachusetts, in Hartford, 
in Atlanta. The National Jaji is establishing Yantaru groups throughout the world, sort of like to infinity and beyond, uh, starting in Cape Town and uh, Dakar and Abidjan and who knows where next. Moving to the third point, knowledge. The first revelation of the Quran says, Ikra, read, recite. Throughout the Quran, the word of God recommends that a human being is obligated to acquire knowledge. If the universe is indeed God made manifest, then it makes sense that the more one knows in the world, the closer one is to God. The acquisition of knowledge can be a spiritual exercise. It is prayer. Asma'u's relationship to the world involved her constant recommendation of spirituality through the use of the intellect. And she was practical. Her poetic topics included outrage at political or military injustices, instruction in practical matters, histories of the Prophet Muhammad and of her own time. Asma'u's eulogies of both women and men never ever mentioned an individual's worldly status, title, or power. Eulogies only spoke of an individual's ethical qualities, kindness, generosity, fairness. Asma'u's poems were composed in the language that suited the audience in keeping with the Prophet Muhammad's advice that the teacher should teach to the level of the student. For example, her brief work on the Quran includes in just 60 lines the name of every one of the 114 chapters of the Quran. She wrote it in full, full day first, testing it out on her family. And then in Hausa, the language of the masses who needed most to learn about the Quran during the re-socialization years after the wars. Long years later, she wrote it in Arabic, perhaps for her colleagues with whom she corresponded across the Maghreb as far away as Fez, Morocco. Asma'u came from a family of scholars whose aim was to spread knowledge. We have her works, but the works of her sisters and cousins remain unpublished, untranslated, and in jeopardy as the original manuscripts sit on shelves in the family home. I hope, we all hope, that they will be received uh, and rescued by some of the many young scholars in northern Nigeria who deserve this legacy of their forebears. Asma'u was a scholar, a poet, and a teacher. She used intellect and scholarship to create poetry. She used poetry to teach. She used teaching to inspire scholarship and poetry in others we would all do well to follow her example. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Beverly Mark, for this so very exciting uh, introduction to um, uh, Nana Asmao. Uh, shalom, salam alaikum, okaro, inakwana, matarongo. Yeah. Uh, I think in the spirit of the legacy of Nana Asmao, I think she will be smiling wherever she is and saying, yes, this is the foundation that I try to set is really met because we are here from different uh, uh, races, from different uh, um, religions, from different uh, backgrounds coming to celebrate her legacy. Thanks also to what has happened in history. It thanks to col the colonial factor. One of the uh, leading historians of Africa, Basil Davidson, said, colonialism had an unforeseen outcome. When the British sent Jean Boyd to northern Nigeria, it is to teach the northern Nigerians how to read and write. But something happened, because she is also somebody coming from a world of spirituality. Uh, Although she is the subject of the crown, she look around and saw literacy and say, by the way, let me, let me rethink my mission. And she, 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 she gave herself uh, and said, well, there is literacy here. 
there is, a, there is an understanding of God, and there is the written. So let me go back and try to learn also from these very people that I was supposed to educate. So to me, that's uh, w the way that the spirit, the spirituality, is uh, reappropriated here uh, in a dialogue of civilization for the individual who is an uh, agent to say, by the way, God, through the work of God, I'm placed here, and what is it that I have to see and recognize and change for the common good? So that, that one dimension that I think it's very important, as a linguist trying to teach uh, the heritage of the Islamic world, I try to look at, uh, to impart this critical reading of, uh, of our cultures and how one cultures encounter, they transform each other. But there is the other side. Jean Boyd could have had like a great heart to say, well, although I am in the mission to bring civilization to these African people, uh, I saw that they are civilized. Actually, they have a great civilization which is rooted in the heritage that uh, uh, Professor Le Beverly uh, Mark just laid out in, in, in the legacy that Nana Asmao set for us. She comes to the family. The family could have said, go back. We are not going to give it to you because you are the representative of the British crown. She did it. The family did not do that. And we are very grateful uh, to... Uh, the eminent and to the entire uh, family for saying we are going to open our heart to give you also this corpus so that it will be part of the world heritage. So uh, this, this is, uh, uh, for me, uh, a conversation, uh, dialogue across civilization and what we learn from each other. And I think this is where uh, this whole event takes a different meaning for me beyond. So my work is to look at the legacy of Asma, Asmao, both from the point of view of the cultural landscape where I come from. I come from Niger and relate to it with the contemporary reality. What happens in the aftermath of colonialism and how is that legacy upheld and what happened to the subject? How is the land divided as Professor uh, um, Bill Miles uh, tell us? Um, in Niger, we were colonized by the French. And what happened with uh, French colonialism is um, French colonialism is predicated upon the idea that the French language is imposed and whatever is related to other cultures has to be displaced. And what gets displaced is Islam and the uh, literacy uh, uh, legacy that comes with, uh, with Islam. The uh, writing in, in, uh, in uh, Arabic classical literature which is uh, imparted to both women and men uh, and, and then from there the Ajami tra tradition which creates also the whole heritage in a uh, that uh, is the body of work of Nana Smao. So in a negotiation within that kind of historical uh, conjuncture, uh, women were really, uh, did not have access to Western schooling. But what happened is as they retrieve within the cultural landscape, they continue with this legacy that was just laid out, uh, uh, that we are trying to examine, the legacy of Nan Asmao. Many Muslim women from the Niger, Niger landscape that define uh, the Sokoto Caliphate, the Niger part. Like if you read the biography, we know that we, uh, it will, uh, places in Niger will be mentioned like Tafadek, like Ag Agades, etc. My work is to try to look at since the, what happened to these women when, when they were denied access to, to the colonial, uh, French co colonial education. Did, this, did they cease to become literate? Did they forget, the, uh, uh, was illiteracy imposed up, upon them? What happened? Um, so I find out that actually you have uh, um, the continuation of this uh, uh, legacy um, through uh, the Quranic school, through the, uh, the heritage of, of Su Sufi tradition. One of the biographers that I, tr uh, the biography that I developed was the, the study of this Sufi woman uh, by the name of Malama Aishatu uh, Denkendu, uh, who was actually married to one of the, uh, uh, the uh, Islamic teachers uh, who now um, um, migrates between uh, Niger and Nigeria. And she lived in a, a town called Anliman. And so throughout her life experience, she developed, uh, she was trained and become a Sufi poet and also a, re a, a, a religious, a very pious person. 
But because Niger is within the landscape of French, where that kind of uh, uh, education was negated even in the post-colonial dispensation, Malama uh, Ashatu was not known until one day in the, in the 80s, there was an Islamic program on the radio. And during the Islamic program, classical Islamic li li uh, poems are recited. And one of the poets from uh, uh, Aliyo Nama uh, Namangi, uh, in Faraji, a famous classical uh, po poem, was recited with a mistake. And this is a woman in her mid-60s listening to radio. And she said, it is my Islamic duty to inform the community that people should not be uh, taught the wrong text. So she spent days thinking about it. And one day she said, no, I have to go and talk to uh, the president of the Islamic Association, Sheikh uh, uh, um, uh, Ismail uh, 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 Alpha Sisi. And when he, he, she came and talked to him, she said, well, I'm just this senior woman just listening to radio, but I think it is my Islamic duty to inform you that a mistake is being aired on radio, and I have to correct it, because my faith does not allow me to continue listening to the wrong uh, uh, text. So Sheikh uh, Ismail Sisi said, well, I think it is time for us to create a program for you on national radio. <laughs> so you see, when we look at the context within which she came, here is somebody who was born within the colonial period, was denied access to education because of her gender, then retrieved into the cultural landscape of this very literacy tradition uh, that we are talking about, which is the domain, the heritage of Nana Asmao, recreate herself in the 80s and appropriate modern technology to start imparting knowledge. And guess what? When she talks about knowledge, she to the, the, radio, the radio program that she hosted was open always with a famous poem, Ilmi. And when you look at it, there was 100, 104 four times where the concept of knowledge, Ilm, is mentioned in the poem. And karatu, karatu here means studying, schooling, both schooling for, for the, the hereafter, the, uh, so the religious, and schooling also for, to address the material need. And so she thought that Islam requires, it is wajib, it's compulsory for us to seek knowledge. And knowledge, as she said, the prophet said, seek knowledge if, if it is in China. And at that time, China was not Islamic. And up to today, we're still try, trying to define China's religious heritage, right, with regard to Islam. But the prophet says, seek knowledge even if it is in, chi in China. So Malama Aishatu, in her poetry, she said, well, if the prophet call us to say, go seek knowledge even if it is in China, it means that you have to do as a, a Muslim. You look for knowledge both in the religious you are grounded in your faith, but that knowledge also has to be multidisciplinary because you have to assure a material basis that is the continuation of your culture and that what you offer to world civilization. So Ilm, when you study that poem, which is part of this, uh, uh, the earlier biographies in the, in the book, you see that even though it is somebody who did not attend Western schooling, she has come to embody an embrace of the importance of learning both your religion, bringing your religion to world civilization, but learning also from the other so that you can contribute to the other and also reinforce your own. So I, I think that's one of uh, the examples that I want to address from that culture, cultural landscape. But there is also derivative legacies. Now I'm working in, a, in, a, in Kenya, in East Africa, a part of Africa that is facing both the Indian Ocean and the Arab Peninsula. They are, uh, so if my earlier work is in predominantly Muslim countries, now my work is in a, in a region, a, a post-colonial state where Muslims are in minority. Guess what, I met somebody who was the first to attend uh, the colonial school. Uh, from, from the Swahili culture. 
Bibi uh, Sophia Muhashemi. When her father um, decided to introduce her to Western school, the community was very upset because the school that opened was actually a Catholic school. The father did not, uh, did, uh, did not succumb to the community pressure. He said, because I'm grounded in my faith, you go and attend that school. When you come home, if they teach you the scripture, I will sit right here with you and teach you the Quran. But what I want from you is to learn what we need so that you, we can develop this community. So B. Sophia became uh, trained through that colonial experience until the post-colonial dispensation, she was a school teacher. And when she retired, she looked at on the ground the data, the ratio of Muslim educated with, um, education versus non-Muslim. The ratio really clearly see, this is a data that is open to everybody. You can go and look at that. Muslim education, when you look at the ratio, it's very low. And one of the reasons is still the onslaught of colonialism where people feel like when they send their children, they will be converted to Christianity. The same thing that her father trying to address. But really, there, was, there is a continuation of that. So B. Sophia decided she's going to transform the nursery school because it's through the, the nursery school that uh, uh, at the age where the student has to, to be initiated to Western schooling, that's the age that also uh, in Muslim society, you send the children to the Quranic school. What she decided to do is to transform the madrasa school system to make the, at the nursery level, to make it an integrated system so that both Islamic education is well imparted and also the curriculum is taught from the perspective of a Muslim. Uh, I want to give you an example of what it, uh, what it is. Nursery school is very important because we know that education is not ideologically neutral. It's, uh, we transmit values. But she wanted to say that that curriculum has to be transformed. So even at that level, she transformed. I give you one example. You know, songs are the one that we, we, we acquire very early, and uh, we recite them without thinking. And sometimes they shape also certain values in us. I give you one example that she transformed. Uh, one of the nursery uh, songs that is supposed to be the secular is one, two, buckle my shoes, right? You are very familiar with that, right? One, two, buckle my shoes, three, four, shut the door, five, six, pick sticks, et cetera, et cetera. So how she Islamized this? She said, I'm going to transform it. One, two, may I be true. Three, four, wherever I go. Five, six, ya odus. Seven, eight, guide me straight. Nine, ten, Allahum amin. Eleven, twelve, ya latif. 13, 14, I'm mu'umin. 15, 16, take me in. 17, 18, janatu na'im, et cetera, et cetera. Many, many uh, uh, rhymes, right? But the, 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 the idea is not only to transform, the, 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 to appropriate, to assimilate, but she also brings uh, uh, songs, uh, nursery songs that are Islamic and share it to, uh, to within the curriculum, something that is rooted. But she didn't also, she wanted to make sure that, okay, you know, Islam, Islam assimilates Africa, but Africa also assimilates uh, Islam. That's why we have like a Ajami and all that. So she brings Swahili songs, so that you see that how Swahili and Islam and other cultures uh, are symbiosis, and what is very important in addressing this roundedness of an uh, African Muslim child. You were not in iso isolation, she brings that. So I, I uh, go uh, to a much younger uh, person uh, 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 by, uh, uh, who, who, is, who is born um, right, within the, colon, uh, the independence uh, 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 time, and who is trying also to influence how Islamic education is imparted. This is uh, 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 Mudira Azara, in, again in Kenya, in Nairobi. She opened the first uh, um, uh, Islamic institute for, for women. 
She herself has been uh, educated in Islamic studies. And she thought, the, you know, the best way to address this issue of um, knowledge, especially knowledge in faith, as a Muslim woman who uh, had university education, I want to address these issues of faith and how we interpret texts and how we live uh, Islam in our re reality. But that experience has to be grounded in no knowledge of the, uh, the fundamental texts so she opened that uh, Islamic school f uh, for, for, for women. She called it the Mahad school. And in the Mahad school, unlike, for instance, the uh, um, first two biographies that I presented, either of, of Malama Aisha to, or of uh, Bibi uh, Sophia Muhashemi, what Malimu Mudira is, is trying to do is to what she called the La Madhab. Uh, uh, Madhab philosophy, which is, she said, it's La Madhab because you, um, Usually, the, the confusion that takes place is uh, most, uh, Muslim who reject West, uh, modern education, uh, you, you see that the idea that the, the interpretation, misreading of what Islam asks, or in the requirement, they don't understand the te text. So she opened that school so that all school of thought will be addressed in, in, in uh, her, her school, rather than restricting it to one school. I want to stop. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite some of the people standing in the doorway to come and sit on the benches up here if um, uh, we have some space so you can come in here, if you can come up the side and sit here. Let's give them just a minute. Come, come, come. There, we can fit at least uh, four people here, I think. You can. Thank you. Can, can you come and <laughs> Don't be shy. We're all here for the scholarship, so there's no reason to be shy. Um, we just want you to be able to hear, and we don't want the door to be clogged. Um, and now we will hear from Mo Dr. Mohammed El Sanusi. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum and uh, greeting of peace. I am, I am truly honored to be here and uh, in fact, uh, I feel very special that uh, I am included in a panel that is uh, dominated by distinguished women scholars. So I think um, instead of speaking for 12 minutes, I think I should speak for 36 minutes. <laughs> just just to, make, to make up, right? <laughs> So um, um, I would like to begin by uh, thanking Harvard Divinity School, uh, particularly uh, the Women's Studies in Religion program, for inviting me here uh, today and for organizing a panel on such an important topic. It is an honor to be here together with uh, His Eminence, uh, the Sultan uh, Sukuto, uh, who represent the great legacy of Nana Asma'u, as well as uh, uh, the very distinguished panelists here. Uh, my topic this afternoon will focus on the impact of Muslim women's religious literacy, the impact and the importance of a, the girl education, the importance of a girl's education. Religious literacy is fundamental to Islam. Indeed, the, the first verse of the Quran that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was read. In the name of your Lord, who created everything, this mandate to seek knowledge is incumbent upon every living soul, both male and female. And so it is critical for the preservation and advancement of our religion to promote religious literacy for all Muslims. At the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the concept of women's rights was virtually non-existent. Islam made bold changes to this society as commanded in explicit verses in the Quran about the equality of men and women in God's eyes 
and detailed regulations granting women's rights such as inheritance. Similarly, Muslim women played prominent roles within that early community, becoming equally learned and well-versed in all matters concerning religion in both public and private life. The wives of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him in particular, served as educators and role models. His first wife, Khadija, was the Prophet, peace be upon him, closest confidant, and Aisha, who survived him, is until today considered one of the most authentic source of hadith or the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Muslim women of knowledge from this era thus contributed to the building of all aspects of society, including public, political, economic, intellectual, social, cultural, and spiritual affairs, establishing an exemplary foundation from which later generation would draw. In more recent history, for instance, there have been several prominent Muslim women figures whose intellectual contribution have had a tremendous impact on the advancement of society in their time. For example, Aisha Abdurrahman bin Tashati was a modern day expert of tafsir, that's a Quran interpretation. She worked, she, she was a professor of of Arabic studies, and she worked for the ministry uh, in Egypt for the Ministry of Education in 1942. But Aisha really also wrote biographies of early Muslim women, including the mother, wives, and daughters of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Despite these exemplary role models and the historical emphasis on religious literacy of women, it is clear that there, there are many issues within the Muslim community worldwide which prevent women from gaining access to religious education. According to the Islamic Development Bank, which uh, headquarters in Jeddah, culture, tradition, and, non, and narrow interpretations of religion are the primary impediment to the emancipation and empowerment of Muslim women. Women and girls in the majority of countries around the world do not receive the same access to educational opportunities as men and boys. According to the United Nations 2010 Human Development Report, even the most highly developed countries in the world still have maintained a disparity between the number of men and women who complete secondary education. Muslim countries are, by and large, no exception. This general lack of emphasis on girls' education has extended to the religious sphere. Women are often excluded not only from leadership positions within the mosques, but are also often excluded from the mosques themselves as a result of cultural norms or a variety of other issues. This exclusion, which begins at a younger age, denies women and girls the opportunity to learn about their religion and thus the ability to benefit from, preserve, and contribute to Islamic scholarship. Several Islamic institutions have risen to the task of empowering women within the Muslim communities. Among the most explicit examples in the international community is the Islamic Development Bank again, which considers the empowerment of women to be one of the key strategic objectives of its mission. The Islamic Development Bank actively seeks to build awareness within Muslim countries on the empowerment of women and to extend support to civil society groups 
that advance the cause of women's education. But here at home, within the Muslim American community here in North America, one of the biggest challenges we face is how to elevate religiously educated women to take on leadership position. As a director of the Islamic Society of North America, I am proud to have served under ISNA's first female president, Dr. Ingrid Mattson. Her presidency inspired Muslim women in America and around the world to embark on studies to become scholars of Islam. Dr. Mattson, as a Canadian-born woman and the head of the largest Islamic organization in America, she became one of the most prominent Muslim women figures in Islam. In her role as a vice president, Dr. Mattson, she helped lead ISNA's co-sponsorship of the Masjid Studies Mosque Study Project, which surveyed 416 randomly sampled mosques in the United States to determine the level of women's participation. The study produced disturbing results, including that 75% of mosque participants were male. Women rarely influenced decisions in the mosque's affairs. But as President Dr. Mattson thus led the development of a booklet entitled Women Friendly Mosque and Community Centers, which called mosques leaders to facilitate women's participation in mosques and presented practical steps on how to accomplish this task. More progress is needed, however, in the implementation of these recommendations across the country. In addition to efforts to increase female participation in mosque, learning and activities, mothers and female educators here in North America have played a significant role in organizing Islamic Sunday schools for boys and girls alike. These women have also spearheaded the widespread transition from Sunday school to the development of full-time Islamic schools across the country. In this particular setting, there is no emphasis on boys' education over girls' education, and the leadership consists largely, largely of women. ISNA hosts an education forum each year, in fact, in Chicago, for the Islamic schools teachers and principals. And each year, you will be shocked to hear these uh, statistics, 80% or more of the participants are female. So basically, women are leading the religious education in our 400 Islamic schools here in the United States. These women recognizing the importance of creating a strong foundation of Islamic principles for their children and children of their community have pioneered the development of this institution in America. In so doing, they have also continued their own studies of Islam in order to maintain their knowledge about the religion and teach it is and teach it to their students. Most recently, we have seen other advances in Islamic education after secondary schools. For example, at the newly founded Islamic University or a seminary called Zaytuna College, women make up the, the vast majority of the student population. Another example, in graduate degree programs and institutions such as Hartford Theological Seminary and Kilerman School of Theology in California, Muslim women compose a rising percentage of future Islamic scholars and leaders. Within the growing female scholarship and leadership here in the United States, our country has received many contributions to Islamic education for boys and girls 
alike. For instance, Ziba Siddiqui, for example, wrote several widely read Islamic children's books and handbooks on Islamic parenting. At ISNA's 12th annual education forum, again, Dr. Farida Shama, who is a woman scholar here in North America, was, pre was presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award for over 25 years of service to the cause of Islamic education. In spite of all of these achievements within our community, a lot of progress must be to further advance Muslim women's religious literacy here and abroad. I therefore present the following recommendations for communities, institutions, and government alike. First, we must invest in girls' education, starting at a young age and continuing to advance degrees. This particular investment is a critical means of advancing our societies economically, socially, politically. In Arabic, there is a famous saying in Arabic, al-ummu madrasatum, idha a'adattaha a'adatta sha'ban tayyib al-'araqi. There is a saying that if you educate a woman, you have prepared your nation well. Denying girls the rights to education denies a society half of its potential resources. The preservation and advancement of a society, of a society's religious knowledge and scholarship is equally dependent on women's education as women play a, a, a larger role in raising future generations both at home and throughout formal education, educational institutions. Second, emphasis must be placed on promoting women's to leadership roles. As these women in turn inspire others to follow suit. One example of an effort to do this is called Woman to Woman program. In fact, the program actually here in Boston, which focuses on connecting youth in the United States with those in Arab and the Muslim world. This particular program run by an organization called Empower Peace, which headquartered in Boston, Woman to Woman brings together emerging young women's leaders aged 15 to 19 from around the globe, engages them in intensive action-oriented leadership training, and connects them to an international network of influential women leaders. We must also make sure that the current female scholars have a seat at the, ta at the table as well. And I am proud to recognize that Dr. Zainab Alawani here was recently appointed as a vice president of the Fiqh Council of North America. The Fiqh Council is the largest Islamic juridical body in North America, and she is the first woman to hold this particular position. Third and finally, we must lift up the positive image of Islamic scholars, such as Nana Asma'u, not only must we present clear role models for, for girls to follow, but we must also present boys and men with female role models so that they grew up with a greater sense of respect for female leadership and scholarship. There is much work need to be done in this regard, and I look forward to the reminding of this uh, day for a more discussion. Again, it is my hope that we can brainstorm about practical next steps to address this problem, and thank you again for having me here. Thank you.
السلام عليكم I really I would like to thank um, Harvard University thank you for this wonderful program especially in uh, the celebrating the contribution of uh, Nana Esmo and especially of course the women's studies here uh, with the leadership of Dr. Brody. Uh, coming after a brother who really uh, explained very well the scholarship, the religious scholarship here in America, um, I would like to take you, I think, with a, a detour, kind of, uh, and try to get some analysis regarding religious scholarship, especially uh, from the Islamic uh, point of view. As uh, someone as working with Muslim community around the world, not only in America, but also in India, Malaysia, uh, Middle East, and other uh, places in the world. And also as someone who studied in different universities, studies Islamic studies in Sudan, uh, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Turkey, and some other also places, and here in America. Someone who is not accepted is just like Nana Esmo, to just to believe in, in one way, to understand the text of the Quran and the Sunnah, or our religious uh, guidance. Someone who also accepted the challenges from the uh, tradition, the cultures, uh, the men authority, uh, who was raised by a father. My father himself uh, was called in so many times as feminist, but in, in a way he was supporting the same guidelines of the Quran and Sunnah, just that the same as Nana Esmo's father did with her and with his community. Someone who stands all the time with women must have this type of education and leadership in our societies all around the world. But at the same time, I come from another analysis, which when it comes with religious scholarship, I will use my own sentence that I use it here. He said this uh, women religious or Islamic scholarship strikes fears on three fronts. And I will mention, I would like to mention the, fir the three fronts. The first one, let me say, and uh, this is a challenge, maybe with the question and answer we'll, we'll go through this, with the Muslim men authority or men in general, dealing also with interfaith and interreligious dialogue in my own work, um, I notice that it's in general. It's uh, when it comes with the religious authority, uh, especially this is for the men to have the ability to interpret the text, to deal with the, of course, religious scholarship. But the women space, it seems like, is very limited. Uh, and it's just like what it was mentioned before me, that the, the first time when it comes with the, with the Prophet Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, uh, it was really focusing on both sides, raising scholars among men and women. And the second front, and I would explain later, this is the fears scholarship, religious scholarship, strikes this kind of fears in what? So men authority, the second one, with the feminist ideology. When it comes with the feminist ideology, again, when we call for religious scholarship or Isla specifically Islamic scholarship, it means it brings back the idea of religion controls women, choices. 
the women in this case maybe limited their choices, and especially if you look at the issue of hijab, uh, the issue of marriage, divorce, uh, inheritance, and as you, most of you know about what we have in, in reality in Muslim world, there are some other challenges that really challenge the women in different issues, and especially when it comes from juristic perspective or legal perspective, you will find, of course, many challenges it comes through this issue. But when women, as scholars, who knows and understand their religion, they will not accept these kind of challenges. The third uh, front, which is, uh, this is something um, maybe different than the previous one, when it comes with the world or global governments, and I would like also to focus on the governments, especially in the, in the Muslim world, of course, versus also Western world. This is when it, uh, the scholar, women scholarship. What does it mean, women religious scholarship? It means it disrupts, it disrupts the status quo, and in this case, challenges the power, the power of the structure that it was already implemented and established under the men authority, or this kind of government. For example, when it comes with the, uh, let, let me challenge in this case, Saudi Arabia. When it, Saudi Arabia itself, with all the, uh, the legal aspects that it was is re representative of Islamic law. But the reality when the Muslim women will understand their own religious scholarship, they understand their text, they understand the Quran and the Sunnah, when, whenever it comes with the, the government banning driving for women, for example, or banning vote, voting for women, Muslim women who is a scholar and well-educated in her religion will stand against uh, these types of laws or rules and would say, from where did you get the law? Um, those are three fronts that we can see as maybe part of the challenges when it comes with the women scholarship. That's why it kind of, maybe it doesn't take the same way as before. But let me go back and try to assure the three fronts. And it's just like the previous encouraging uh, uh, as, uh, presentations. And by studying Nana Esmo's is legacy herself, it's the, really the witness and testimony for all the, the, the previous three fronts, the fear that we have, it's really, it's not there. And it shouldn't be there as long as we have strong uh, scholars, Muslim women who are really studying, understanding, educated by their, uh, their Quran and Sunnah. And I'm, I'm speaking about the Islamic scholarship. Um, I would like also to mention that the history itself, reading our history, proved something different. Reading the history, starting with the first community around the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, it proved something different. When men and women are scholars, are uh, partners, and scholars to work toward building strong, healthy community and society. The second front in the history it came, of course, into different ways. But I will choose and focus on maybe one of, of uh, that period of time during Mamluki, Mamluk uh, uh, period, when we hear a lot and we study about the, the role of women uh, in building the system of endowment, awqaf. And it was the most strong, the strongest endowment in the history, the Muslim history and even uh, human history, that it was established during that time. 
And if we ask about and try to make our researches, of course we have different maybe assumption comes through this. But one of the main uh, assumption and one of the main, in fact, facts that it was proven that the women scholarship, religious scholarship, was highly approved by the government from one side because also the women who were in charge or the sultan, uh, the, uh, the wives, the uh, sisters of the, the, the rulers themselves encouraged this type of a scholarship. And it was a role model that most of the time you will find the royal wife or sister work with religious leadership from among the women to find out, to mentor, and try to find out about the society, the need, the need of the society. So what they did, they work as grassroots movement at that time. And they build, of course, uh, uh, schools, universities. They build shelters. They even, in the market, they were involved in the market itself. So this is by itself a proof for us that the scholar, religious scholar, Islamic scholarship among women is really for the uh, spreading social justice and, of course, uh, also uh, uh, gender justice. Uh, the last one also comes with, of course, we have Nana Esmo from one side, but even for today, many nations uh, in Egypt, Indonesia, Malaysia, in Africa, uh, Nigeria, for example, women who took this role seriously, their role seriously, and start building and establishing this kind of religious scholarship, Islamic scholarship, what they did is building, enhancing their own societies in different ways, organization, uh, uh, dealing and trying to confront, of course, uh, the economy from one side, working with the, uh, with the, with the women. In Bangladesh, for example, men, women specifically who are working to improve their families' uh, uh, status and conditions. Uh, even in India, you, you find the women who they, they really took their uh, role religiously, uh, 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 seriously, those are the front, uh, uh, the, the, the front line of uh, dealing with the society and building and trying to build this kind of society. So in conclusion, I really, I would like uh, to ask different questions. So now for the religious or the Islamic scholarship of women, where of course we study, we try uh, to have the say of understanding our texts, the Quran and the Sunnah. And we uh, have many studies now in the universities, uh, whether here in, in the West, in, in US, or even in the Middle East, in the Muslim world. But now also the question is, how do we uh, try to approach the women Islamic scholarship? At the same time, how do we deal with the text? Uh, in a way that we have to find out more about the Muslim, uh, Muslim women movement around the world they found out that we have to keep it as justly balanced scholarship. It means we don't lose the sight. We are working as partners with our brothers. We are working to build a family. At the same time, we are building our communities, but together, not by ourselves. And this is by itself, it's a slogan that it comes with the balance, how to build a balanced community. And I will just uh, try to uh, quote finally in conclusions what it was said uh, and written by Dr. Mack in her book regarding Nana Esmo, what, what she was saying here. Esmo's appeals to the ruled and the rulers alike. Each individual is expected to consider his or her own position in relation to the ultimate truth. 
that should be every person's focus. The foundation of the community was of primary importance and that is clarified here for scholars, rulers, and warriors. Verse after verse, counsels, patience, justice, fair play, loyalty, righteousness, and forbearance. Harmony was the political objective, a goal which matched the harmony of inner self with God. And I would like to end my speech with this. Thank you. Assalamu uh, alaikum and thank you for the invitation and I have been, as I have been introduced, I'm just a doctor, a practitioner, an obstetrician and gynecologist. So what am I doing with scholars of Islam and Muslim history? Uh, the Sultan specifically, who is the leader of the Muslim society, uh, a little over 80 million Muslims in Nigeria, has asked me to represent him in this discussion simply because of, I think, two things. One, I'm a woman, and Nana Asma was a woman. And I think secondly, I'm part of the community in Nigeria struggling to leave the legacy of Nana Asmao. So having heard the history and the lives of Nana Asmao from scholars, and haven't learned what she stood for, and how the Quran puts it and how she struggled to leave the Quran within the context of the Sokoto Caliphate. What I'll try to do this morning is to give you a brief of how the Muslim women in Nigeria are currently situated. And earlier on, Zainab and I were discussing, and she was lamenting at the news and, 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 and media projections of Nigeria and how backward the Muslims are, particularly of northern Nigeria. And I said to her, I'm not surprised. For one, the media has to, as a survival strategy, be sensational to be bought. And unfortunately, in the United States in particular, and having worked with a lot of organizations and institutions in the United States, I realized the United States is one big, 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 um, if I say a well, for lack of a better word. Not a river, not an ocean. You have you appear to have everything you need, so you don't look outside the well. So therefore, most of what is consumed is essentially produced locally, and is sufficient. But then when a fish jumps out of the well, suddenly there's a realization, oh my God, so this is not a river, this is but a well. <laughs> so having said that, I, I think what we're trying to struggle with within the context of Nigerian Muslim women is to see how, as Muslims, we believe education is situated within the context of the Quran and exemplified by Nana Asma'u in her lifetime. So therefore, we also essentially are faced with challenges of culture, having been Western educated, having friends who are Western educated, trying to be more than trying to be Western, yet trying to be a good Muslim woman, trying to live within the culture of my history, trying to essentially be a Muslim woman living in northern Nigeria, yet educated, speaking English. So this is the dilemma. And as we grew up uh, in school, we associated ourselves with Muslim student society, like every Muslim. But then we got the challenges of how the dichotomy. I'm not like my mother, yet I'm not like my sister in the US or in the UK. Who am I? We then started struggling with the issues of identity, the issues of values, how do I continue to live as a Muslim, but most importantly, as a Western-educated Muslim, especially that we grew up to understand that there's something Western education and Islamic education. It took a lot of years to realize that there's really, in reality, or within the context of Islam, there's no such dichotomy. So therefore, growing up in that matrix, and I personally had to grow up in attending a school where I was the only Muslim girl in my set. So I had to go to church in the morning, on Sunday go to church, and then come and struggle to pray five times a day, and then to go through all that motion. But within the context of MSS, Muslim Student Society, 
we grew up trying to struggle to learn what Islam was. This is not to say that we did not learn at home. What we learned at home, we learned the Quran, we memorized the Quran. A lot of us memorized the Quran even before going to secondary school. But we did not know the meaning of the Quran. We also chanted some songs. But as children, we also did not know the implication of those things. So a group of us growing up uh, struggled through MSS, but MSS is for students. We eventually helped to outgrow Muslim student society, and we were thrown to the larger society where the real struggle started. And it was within this context that we realized that we needed to do something. And of course, we read the story of Nana Asmao. Growing up in Nigeria, you had to know about the Shehu in various forms. And as you grew older, particularly if you decided to follow the, the, the path of female activism, then you knew about Nana Asmao. So we struggled to see how do we live in this matrix of society where there's confusion, where we had no identity or we're struggling to develop our own identity. So it was within this context that with the support, very strong support of our male brothers in the MSS, that a movement, if I may call it that, started in Nigeria in the 1980s, late 70s, 1980s, where the vast majority of Muslim women are uneducated, so Islamia schools had to essentially be started. Not to learn modern stuff, but to even learn basic about religion. People read the Quran, people memorized the Quran, but did not even understand the religion itself, did not know how to pray properly, did not know the code of conduct of being Muslims. So a lot of Islamia schools were started for women, and these are schools that were started like a wave. Hundreds, thousands, millions of women started going to schools in the evening. And this is still a culture in Nigeria. Anybody who goes to northern Nigeria now, every night you see thousands of women in their hijabs going to Islamia school, in the evenings, on Saturdays. And these are no schools that you have to go out of way to build. We just use any public school that's available that allows us permission to just use it when their children are not there. Or you, we use houses, or we use courts, courtyards. But the more interesting one was in 1985, following the Muslim Sisters Organization and the uh, Muslim Student Society, when we came as a group of educated Muslim women who were concerned on living as Muslims, yet struggling within the context of dual culture and values, to start an organization called the Muslim, uh, Federation of Muslim Women's Associations in Nigeria. And in 1985, we started that as an upspring of our activism as Muslim Student Society and later as Muslim Sisters Organization. And at the moment, the Federation has over 250 affiliate groups, and we're spread in all the 36 states of the FCT, and we have a couple of million Muslim women who voluntarily identify themselves as members of the Federation of Muslim Women. Now, with the spirit of Nana Asma'u, what does the Federation stand for? Basically, we stand to improve the lives of women and children and the Muslim Ummah, to be able to live more or less the Muslim life they want to live. And our primary focus of uh, intervention is education. Education, education, education. Wherever you found Form 1, Form 1 is, is involved in education. Of course, we do the non-formal education as well as formal education. We run nursery schools, we run primary schools, we run secondary schools, and we have a few uh, tens, a few dozens of primary schools, a dozens of uh, nursery schools, and of course hundreds of adult education for women. We believe strongly that education is the key to whatever. Education is the key to our being Muslims. Education is the key to our humanity. But most importantly, in Form 1, we also believe that the woman is primarily an identity of her own. Because everywhere in the Quran, Allah refers to the Muslim woman, the believing man, and the believing woman. And each and every one of us is supposed to account for their lives. And so therefore we thought, as Muslim women, we needed to take the bull by the horn and begin to see how we can salvage our lives vis-a-vis -vis how we're going to meet our Lord. Because in the end, our Lord is not going to look at us because we're female or male. He's going to ask us to account for our lives individually. So it is within that premise that we took that challenge and decided to focus on education, health, 
So wherever you, uh, we believe education and health are very closely interrelated because without health, you can't have education. Without education, health doesn't work. So we took those. And of course, everywhere you found Form 1, we encourage groups to have income generation. One of the key problems we have in is poverty, and poverty is worse among women. So we encourage women to ha earn some livelihood. So you find women in Form 1 doing uh, uh, knitting, weaving, some do, ink, uh, some, some do uh, fabrics, some make hijabs, all kinds of things. But what is crucial is the fact that we try to see how we can live a life of Muslims educated, but not throwing away our cultures. Because one of the reasons that there is resistance to Western education is the belief that once you have Western education, you automatically become a Westerner. You drop your cloth, you go for jeans and t-shirt, you stop speaking your native language, you kind of become something else. You're neither Western nor local. You, you kind of become totally confused. But most importantly, people value their values. And there's a lot of resistance because there's the fear that once you have Western education, you're automatically going to throw your values and pick up Western values. And that is a big problem. And that's one of the reasons why girls are not going to school, especially in rural areas. So in Form 1, we decided, OK, let's be as cultural as we can. Let's be as Muslims as we can and pursue education. Of course, it's not a, a bed of roses. Initially, there was a lot of resistance. In fact, anybody married to us was laughed at because he was seen as Mujang Hajia. It's like the husband of, um, like he's the kind of house boy husband. <laughs> that kind of thing. Our husbands were laughed at because suddenly we had to go out, we had to work, we had to earn a living. And as a strategy in the organization, for the first 10 years of our existence in nine, from 1985 to 1995, we took a decision not to receive any financial support from anybody. We refuse to receive financial support from Muslim organizations that are male. We refuse to uh, 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 accept official donations from our husbands, from Muslim countries. We refuse from Saudi Arabia, we refuse from Iran, we refuse from everybody because we wanted to have our own identity. And Alhamdulillah, we were able to focus on that, otherwise we would have soon been gone because would have been torn into sects. Because once you're in Form 1, you drop whatever school of thought you belong to. You just simply walk in there as a Muslim woman, and that's the only identity we all have. Uh, the, and of course, uh, we realized that we just could not do it that way. Nigeria is small, and the challenge of the problem is beyond us. The fact that we are in West Africa categorized into countries is totally foreign. When I came in, Usaina and I suddenly, we left uh, our sister Zainab out of the discussion. We all started talking in Hausa, and she was looking from one mouth to the other. Yet, I'm Anglophone, Nigerian, she's Francophone, Niger. But for us, that's artificial. So we decided to see how can we move from where we are to include all our sisters. And in 1996, I remember I was six months pregnant with my son. We decided to go on tour of West Africa and to see what we can do with our sisters. So we took a plane from Nigeria and hopped on every West African coast along that line. In fact, I remember we landed in Liberia in the middle of the war. And the whole country came and said, what are these women doing in the middle of the war? And the then interim president came to receive us in the airport and he said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? We said, oh, anyway, Muslim women live here, so we've just come to see them. So he said, OK, if that's what you want. And so that is how far. So at the moment now, we have Federation of Muslim Women in Niger, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Liberia, the Gambia. And we all try to meet. When we have our annual conference, we invite them. Every year, for when has an annual conference to discuss topical issues that are of concern to us as Muslim women. And we do discuss this on an intellectual level. 
so that we begin to give women a space where we can discuss our own issues within the prism of Muslim women scholars and women-friendly male scholars. <laughs> and as an example, if I may, in the last two years, the last two years, the theme of our conference was women, Muslim women and politics. And it was the year of our election. And we encourage Muslim women to go into partisan politics. And I'm proud to say some of our state presidents actually participated and one actually contested for the National Assembly. She did not win, but that's a statement that you wouldn't even think of doing 20 years ago. So Form 1 tries to do that, and we look at issues that are important to us. Muslim women are reproductive health. What does Islam say about reproductive health? What does Islam say about controversial issues? We had a conference on Islam and sexuality education. What does that say? Where people do not want to talk because it affects our lives and the lives of our children, we dare to talk and we get scholars to give us the Islamic version of what the discussion is. But we do have challenges. As I said earlier, identity was an initial challenge, which was a good challenge because it made us who we are. Funding. We were naughty. We refused to take anybody's penny or dollar, which turned out very good for us because we then developed our own identity. And it, it, it's very interesting. I remember the, the, Council, the Supreme Council of Islamic Affairs, the biggest, biggest Council of Islamic Affairs before the Sultan uh, assented, um, went on a visit to some countries in the world. And they said, are you members of Form 1? <laughs> and the Sheikh of Borno had to come and say, who is this Form 1? Can they just come and join us so that people would stop asking us if we were members of Form 1? Uh, at, at, at that time, and uh, it's, it's so interesting to see, we were the only Muslim women group that were given observer status in the United Nations during the Beijing conference. So those were the kinds of things that happened. But more importantly, the biggest challenge we've had, and we still have, is actually how to deal with our brothers. We are not living in a world of our own. We do have Muslim men. And until recently, the Muslim men did not have very organized adult education for Muslim men. So you can imagine the internal crisis happening in the home. The woman wakes up, finishes all her household chores, gets up, goes to a school where she learns about what Islam says. And she comes back to live with her husband like their fathers lived. Now, that is conflict. And in the early stages, before our brothers who are part of the uh, MSS and the Muslim Ummah started schools, evening school for men, there were threats of divorce and marital disharmony. Because the woman suddenly says, you know what? Anyway, I'm going to help with the household. I'm going to help with the cleaning. I'm going to help with the cooking because uh, the prophet said it has a lot of reward. But you know what? It's not an obligation. That is a challenge. And one goes to earn a living, she earns probably more salaries than her husband. And she chooses to help out in the home. But the day she's not happy, she's angry, she says, you know what, I'm not buying the rice up in the rain. But the, what really made that lighter was the spirit. Because the spirit was essentially trying to earn Allah's reward. So that made it much lighter. Another challenge is the magnitude of the problem. Nigeria is huge, 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 huge. And how many women are educated? How many women sit and articulate to implement this program? It is huge, it is a challenge. So there's a huge number of Muslim women that are left out. An important one that we still have not been able to really solve is scholarship. Scholarship in the sense that a lot of us, people like me, do read the Quran. People like me read the interpretation of the Quran in English. I read literature in English. It's not good enough. It wasn't written in English initially. We need to go, go a step forward and go to the original text and learn. Because these are how scholars are made. And this is how the discussion is taking place within the 
uh, prism of, uh, of, of intellectual discourse. Now, finally, the issue of education. For those of you that are in areas where I work, in reproductive health, we do know that the issues of health is a major problem. Particularly, and I know the question is going to come up, that's why I'm putting it forward. The issue of maternal mortality. Nigeria has one of the worst maternal mortality in the, country, in, in the world, only second to India. And if you take northern Nigeria where Muslims are predominantly living, it's probably going to be the worst. And the main driving force is lack of education. And I think this is where the main recommendation that Form 1 is trying to push now comes from. We need for anybody who is interested in developing an ummah or a community, education is the key. And I mean education in its broader sense. But also most importantly, as a community of Muslim women, we need to begin to take the responsibility of our future into our hands. And I mean we need to go outside the comfort zone to go into fields that are traditionally male, that are traditionally non-Muslim male, uh, Muslim, uh, non-Muslim women within the context of Nigeria. But importantly, these spheres have been occupied by Nana Asma'u herself. Nana Asma'u was an advisor to her brother, Muhammad Bello. She was part of the council of advisors that advised Muhammad Bello on the running of the Sokoto Caliphate. So why is it that we are abrogating that responsibility? And so therefore, we strongly believe that as Muslim women living in the community of, Mus in, in the, our country, Nigeria, we also need to look at the issue of democracy and good governance. And if things have to get into scale, responsible Muslim and men and women need to go into actually partisan politics and take governance. Because how can you cause change in large scale if you relegate to the background? How do you expect politicians who have worked hard? They hardly sleep. I live in one. They work 20 hours a day. But they have their own agenda. How do you expect them, having worked 20 hours a day, having their own agenda for their self-enrichment when they finally maneuver and become leaders that they do your own agenda? It's not human. It's not human. So we need, as Muslim women, to go into active, responsible politicking, leadership, or whatever that calls for. But we can't do that, of course, without the support of our men. So whatever we do, we always do with our men, and they are our brothers. We actually call them Form 1 men. We don't allow them to go in because we really want to remain with our own identity, but we call them Form 1 men. And so therefore, in the programs we are running, like our Girls Education Scholarship, by the way, the Sultan himself supports one of our very big girls' education program where we run scholarship for girls that are very, very intelligent from poor family backgrounds. We give them scholarship from, uh, from one. I don't know how it is in, from grade, grade, grade seven to grade 12. So that we make sure that they really transition from grade seven to 12, so that they're ready to pick up uh, with life. Um, am I on time? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so this is basically Form 1, and this is basically how we try to leave the legacy of Nana Asmao in contemporary Nigeria. This is not to say it's all bed of roses, but we need the support of anybody who would want to support a girl study in Nigeria. Wherever I go, I always, always, always beg for support of girls in Nigeria. You know how much it costs? Per annum, $450. Tuition, boarding, books, everything together. So I hope I'm going to have 200 people supporting girls in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our panelists for both enlightening us and complicating the legacy of Nana Asmao. Uh, she does not exist in a vacuum, 
And the world that in which we are trying to understand her legacy is not the world that she lived in. It is a world uh, affected by colonialism and post-colonialism and gender discrimination and all of our panelists have uh, really helped us to see these things. I would like to uh, first ask if anyone on the panel or his eminence would uh, like to respond or ask questions of each other before I open to the floor um, for questions. Does anybody? I see people turning. Would you like to? Bismillah, Bismillah <clears throat> Rahman Rahim. I just want to say something, and uh, I believe all of you here must have given me the credit for allowing Dr. Mandela to speak on my behalf, <laughs> because I think uh, she carried all of you along, especially her presentations. And the last request of $450 times 200. <laughs> I don't know how much tax you pay to the US government. First, I would like to just thank all the panelists. And before also thanking the panelists, thank all of you for taking your Sunday off to be here for this uh, seminar. But I think. Any knowledge gained, it's never a waste. And I'm sure so many of you must have learned a little bit about somebody somewhere who never existed in your mind before. But today you have heard there was somebody who lived a life of knowledge, scholarship, and whatever. The point, uh, two points. We fully support girl education. And she testified to that, both financially and morally. Because we believe that's the only way out of solving the problem of our country. So I don't expect questions to be thrown at me why we are not doing this. We are doing whatever is humanly possible to have all our girls educated. And that's a stand that I took almost five years now, since that Almighty God brought me to this seat. And I want to also to let you know, I personally uh, sort of sponsor a lot of Muslim girls to read medicine in Nigeria, because I found that we have very few number of Muslim doctors in Nigeria. So, so far, I'm, I'm so sort of close to 35 girls. Six have already graduated, <laughs> and the rest are on in a very quiet way. We don't broadcast it. But it's just to show that for you to be a leader, you have to lead by example. So if tomorrow somebody comes to me that he's taking his child out of school, I will definitely not agree. And that's one of the problems we've been having, which she did not bring up. Some of our parents refuse to let their, their child go to school. And that's why last year I called a seminar of Muslim scholars in the northern Nigeria on girl child education. And it was an excellent seminar because nobody, no scholar had said anything negative about educating the girl child. So we are putting together the process of that seminar and take it to the federal government to assist us in maybe making laws as regards solving that problem. One of the points I wanted, wanted to bring is the Dr. Khalifa leaders really solidly stand behind 
women not being subjected to cooking, washing, and other household chores. It's purely if they so wish to, like the doctor said. It's not Islamic. Islam did not say a woman should go and sit down in the home and cook for her husband, wash, the, wash for her husband, produce children, and that's all. No. And there are so many quotations uh, in that regard. And I'm always ever ready to make such quotations in uh, my speeches. Finally, because I know I want to give you time, we're almost, we just have about 20 minutes. But since I'm the main subject here, I could request them to add 30 more minutes if you are not too tired, because I'm not. But I want to tell you things are changing, and I'm very optimistic, I'm very positive. Things will change in our country, where women will have a right to, sue, to say or do what they should do. And I believe whatever a man can do, like they used to say, a woman can do better. Just like my sister here had proved to us that the presentation was better than the one of my brother here. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to tell you that uh, when we're talking of Form 1, Federation of Muslim Women of Nigeria, Muslim Women Associations of Nigeria, I want to tell you that association is fully under Nigeria Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs because we do everything together with them. We carry them along. And I happen to be the President General of that association. So bringing her here just got to show that she is under me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I allowed her to say all these good things. But it's somebody that we are so proud of. And once she talked about uh, what, were, what were the words she used? I wrote them down. <laughs> Husband, houseboy. <laughs> Women friendly, male scholars. <laughs> she knows what she's saying. <laughs> and I want to tell you right here, all the things she said, there's somebody solidly supporting her, her own husband. And he's right here in this hall. So please stand up. <laughs> Faith there. <laughs> Is he a husband, houseboy? <laughs> Are you? <laughs> so thank you, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Your Eminence. I, I can't wait to quote this to m my husband. <laughs> <laughs> He's home with the children. <laughs> but he looks forward to meeting you tomorrow when, uh, when my mother-in-law will be helping out. Um, uh, let me ask for questions from the audience. And um, if uh, uh, Celine has a microphone, so she can move to um, each hand as we see them go up. And I think what I'd like to do is if there are, uh, is maybe take three questions uh, together and then I will give our panelists uh, and his eminence an opportunity to respond to uh, any of those questions. And can you identify yourselves, please? Sure. Um, my name is Muzna Madiha. Um, I recently graduated from Loyola University, Chicago with a master's in applied sociology. My question is to Dr. Alwani and Dr. Mandara. First of all, um, I just wanted to say thanks a lot to all the panelists for a very insightful and um, motivational presentations. Uh, my question is pretty much that we've spoken on how we have a lot of uh, um, experiences of Muslim women from the past, and we have textual evidence from the Quran that is supporting women's advancement. However, when it comes to textual interpretation of the Quran and Hadith, there is a lot of diversity. And so my question is that in your experiences working within uh, Muslim circles, have you come across Muslim male scholars uh, who have um, made it difficult for the advancement of women or who are actually limiting it? And they're not justifying that based on 
culture or something that's outside Islam, but they're trying to justify that on the basis of their interpretations of the scriptural text, and that's the Quran and Hadith. So have you come across that challenge? And if so, how have you guys dealt with that? Thank you very much. And we're, we're going to take a, uh, two more questions, um, maybe one in the front, and then one back there. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Habib Habu. I'm the Consul General of Nigeria in New York. I just want to thank Dr. Alidu because I see myself uh, as a Nigerian because I served for five years in Niamey and I was able to visit the whole country. She took me back to what I used to listen on the radio, mm. the preachers of the sheikh. The, the lady was so good. But uh, Dr. Alidu refused to tell us the background, the, the status of women, women and woman education at that time in terms of Islamic education. She, she didn't go into that because it was so pathetic in Niger that at that time that there was only 15 minutes of preaching in a week on Friday at 1, between 1 to 1.15. Women are told that they don't have to pray. They don't have to fast during Ramadan until after they have uh, gotten married. The Sheikh, as she mentioned, not only fought that, but she became instrumental to the development of Islamic education for women using the radio stations that came up. People like Grema Bukhar, when they established their radio stations, they gave Islamic scholars time, especially the preachers of the lady, to, to do more to, to help with girl education in Niger. So maybe you need to tell a little of that, and uh, it will assist people to understand okay. yeah, where you're coming from. Okay, let's get one last question back there, and then we'll give our uh, panelists a chance to respond. Um, greetings of peace. My name is Mariam Sharif, and I am extremely excited um, because I graduated from the Divinity School here. And um, you know that some papers can be a chore. So I took Professor Alupina's class, and what did I happen to talk about is Nana Asma'u's transformative influence on 19th century religion and society and beyond. So I'm so excited to finally meet Beverly Mack, who I emailed a bazillion times, and Jean <laughs> Boyd, who I had to call in England once, and um, see Professor El Elwani here, again, whose father was my teacher before, and to finally meet uh, the Sultan of Shkoto, who, um, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, so my question is about the Medinan model um, of the Shkoto Caliphate. And um, is the strategy of using or working within Islamic parameters or Islamic educational parameters um, with the cultural hurdles that we have in Nigeria, is that the best strategy or the strongest strategy, since in the Quran, um, God uh, recognizes there's a difference between males, mudhakir, and men, rijal. Um, are males and the socio-cultural hurdles um, making less of an impact, or um, is uh, the assistance of males or men um, impacting the greater good of Nigerian society as a whole. So I'm going to take one fourth question because it seems to be very urgent, and I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it will be briefly stated. Assalamu alaikum, jamaat muslimin wal muslimat. My name is uh, Alhaji Garba Suleiman, alias Krako, uh, the Boston Housing Police, a former. Uh, I was a lecturer here at Harvard. And uh, I'm going to ask a question 
regarding the last speaker, she touched so many important points regarding uh, Nigerian women that need help educationally. Uh, my question to her is, right now on the floor, is regarding her, what are you doing to help the very much interested and brilliant women in Nigeria to come along with what late Sheikh Abu Bakr Mahmoud Gumi, may so rest in peace, tried to advocate for years about the Muslim brothers should encourage the women to take part in every aspect of job in Nigeria, going to the high schools of education, of higher learning, and so forth. Now, there is a certain even issue coming up in Nigeria about this uh, Islamic banking, which we have a lot, a lot of Muslim ladies who are very determined to be in the field of banking profession. We have so many who are even here as uh, applicants in the PhD program uh, on banking and finance. And I hope, I wish, through the Islamic uh, MSS uh, Forum will help these uh, young ladies achieve their aim and objectives. And like I said earlier, the late Sheikh had been trying to advocate women to join military, police, all sort of aspect of uh, life in Nigeria. You can hardly see women going to the highest office of any kind of different cadre in Nigeria. So it's a challenge to the MSS. Thank you very much. That's my little so, uh, question. Thank you for ask. the four questions. And who, what brave person? Uh, Meru, do you want to begin? And, but you are all most welcome to chime in. Just uh, your mics are on. Uh, the, the first question has to do with how to deal with uh, scholars who use Islam to kind of relegate uh, Muslim women education to the background. And um, as is well known, Islam is a very dynamic religion and it actually encourages discussions and challenges and interpretations and discourse. The text is sacrosanct. It is the word of Allah, it cannot be changed. But the interpretation and discussions, that's why we have different schools of thought. And in fact, in the earliest ages of Islam, Islam, there was so much diversity. That's the beauty. That's what Islam, why Islam was rich. And that was why it developed to the extent to which it did. There was no straight jacketed interpretation. Now, in dealing with those kinds of scholars, what I would, and I don't know if my strategy would work for you or how we do, is what text of the Quran says that? I'm not sure there's a single text in the Quran that says women must not be educated. If anything, when the Quran came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it started with Iqra. And it's a command for men and women. So if you take the discussion on the level of the text of the Quran, not anybody's interpretation, on the level of the text, nobody is going to, I mean, is going to give you a superior argument. The second is what does the prophet himself say? He urged Muslims to go for education, even if it meant going to China. And as my sister said, China, can you think of China when you were in Arabia? There were no planes, there were no cars. There were only horses and donkeys and camels. And he encouraged you to ride on your camel to go to China and learn. And China did not speak Arabic. So stage one, learn their language. Stage two, into their culture. Stage three, the hurdle of transportation. So it's about the most conceivable difficulty. He said, go through that for education. So I think if you, if, if, but we cannot do that ourselves. We cannot engage in that discourse unless we ourselves know the Quran, unless we ourselves know the substance, unless we ourselves as women learn to learn the text itself outside interpretations given to us. Then the second is, uh, what are we doing about Muslim women taking all kinds of professions? I think that's basically why I'm a doctor. I'm a gynecologist. And um, what we do is to encourage every woman to go after her passion. Whatever 
whatever it is that you want to be. Be it, but not just be it average. Be it as an A+, plus, because that's the only time it makes a lot of sense. How do we deal with men? You know Nigerian men as much as I do, or even better than Nigerian men. The best way is for men like you to engage other men. That's why we have the Form 1 men. I, ha I remember I had a project. I had a, 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 a project where we, are, we were training Muslim health workers on integrated reproductive health, including HIV and stuff, medical stuff, in Sokoto. And we had to die. Uh, that was um, about 15 years ago. And we had to talk to men, Islamic scholars. One of the key things we needed to do to talk about reproductive health is to educate Muslim scholars on reproductive health. But I was a female, and I was a lead trainer. So you cannot believe it, how we went about it. I was the front of the project, but when we went to Sokoto, for one and a half years, I did not exist, because I did not even show up my face at the training place. We got men to do it. When the scholars understood and were very comfortable, then I surfaced, and there was no resistance. So these are strategies you never win by fighting. You, you have to look at it from the prism and assume that a lot of things are based on lack of, on lack of knowledge. And once there's knowledge, things change. I worked extensively on female genital mutilation. All my publications are called female genital mutilation. I now call it female genital cutting. And I spent years investigating on female genital mutilation. I was so shocked when I went to somewhere in the southeast, around Ife, to look at the history of why female genital cutting was taking place. Long, long ago, the oracle, they had high infant mortality. And the oracles told them that the babies were dying simply because the head of the babies were touching the clitoris. That was why they were dying. And what's the, head, what's the tip of a clitoris compared to the life of a child? So they chopped it off. And then I came in as a female activist. Oh, no, you're trying to suppress women's sexuality, da, 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 da. And when I got to see the reason behind it, I was so ashamed of myself. Because the only thing that could help change that paradigm is educating them and giving them alternatives that these babies do not die because they touch the head, the, the heads touch the tip of the clitoris, because there are other medical conditions. And once they understand that, and you show them respect, they drop the act. So it's not by feminine fighting for women's sexual rights, but simply by knowledge, given alternative. And that's a lesson we've learned. And I want to challenge my brother to please come and help us in dealing with this issue with Nigerian men. Thank you. Thank you. Usaina, did you want to take the question on Niger? Thank you very much. Uh, the question regarding uh, the aspects of uh, how Malama Ashatu uh, came to lead a radio program and what is left. Uh, I think this is something, because we had just 10 minutes, I couldn't go in details into his history. But uh, in my book uh, on, on Niger, Muslim Women in Niger, and uh, that's uh, historical background to how Islam is taught both for men or for women and, uh, and what happens when women decided uh, to intervene in the sphere of uh, religion to be religious agents uh, is covered. So uh, Niger, just like in many uh, Muslim countries in Africa, the one I, I, I studied, you find that um, there are many preachers Man, many clerics um, who are really not in touch with the text. And yet, they are the ones who are the voices that you hear on radio. And so the problem is how to undo it. And I thought it was really very courageous uh, from the uh, Sheikh uh, Ismail to give the opportunity uh, to uh, Malama Aishatu to come to uh, the public, especially given uh, the, elect uh, the power of electronic media, just like as my sister said, imagine Muslim happens through media. And one way to undo 
when you are, you are having a representative of a religion who does not even know the primary text is to present the right teachers. And I thought that was very important. Uh, so, but the democratization process with the opening up of the political space with pluralism, that what grants the possibility for people uh, who are really trained in Islamic uh, studies to be given an alternative to come. Because before, there is a monopoly. It's not only Niger. It's not only in former French colonies. It happens uh, in other countries. Democratization and uh, uh, opening up of pl uh, political space really uh, creates a, a possibility for uh, 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 rethinking what is, it, what is the knowledge that is being imparted and whether you are really, we are dealing with knowledgeable pe people and also to give the opportunity for women to come, uh, come up uh, as a religious agents. And so I gave just uh, here an illustration of someone who was born during the colonial period and what she has become. Uh, if if uh, the, the process was not open up, uh, the democratization didn't open up for pluralism, this woman will never have had the opportunity to be in school because the Islamic association up to the 90s was really a male, uh, uh, predominantly male association, especially in the, in the, in the public. Uh, sp space. Our time has gone by very quickly. Is there any one of the panelists um, who, Zainab, would you like it? Another word. Okay. Um, I, I would like to answer the first question, um, which is uh, important, and um, I agree 100% with my sister here, what she mentioned about the interpretations. And of course, for, uh, for us, we value this variety of interpretations in Islam. It's by itself. And at the same time, uh, we, we are proud that it's, it's this type of uh, interpretations, it's also enhanced the knowledge. And at the same time, of course, they open the discussions to uh, different views. But mostly the, the classical and the traditional interpretation is, of course, uh, do dominated by uh, the men. Uh, themselves in understanding of the text. Now, when we add our voice, and uh, in this case, it's not uh, to only to challenge what, but we have, we open the discussion. We are in dialogue with, with the text itself from the beginning. And this kind of dialogue, it opens different gates and uh, also different questions. And raising those questions are challenging, of course, uh, the previous interpretations that mostly for our brothers in some areas, and you mentioned about the scholars, the scholars, we are facing different, uh, I, I guess, challenges from the scholars from one side and also the, the Muslim community on the uh, other side. But with the scholars, really, we, as, as a sister mentioned beautifully, that most of the time we use the same text with the Quran dealing with the Quran, understanding holistically, not in a fragment, in the, and also understanding the sunnah of the prophet himself in the light of the Quran. It means the explanations and the interpretations, which is, again, you ask also about the Medina society, of course, according to uh, Mavi, Nana Esmo and her father, building this kind of, of understanding I think this is what we are heading toward this debate. And that's when it brings the, the brothers from the other side uh, very closely to, our, to the interpretation that we are providing. It's, uh, as uh, I think uh, Dr. Busaina mentioned also, because most of the time when the Muslim women approach the Quran or approach the Sunnah, uh, immediately, will be accused as a feminist or carrying this kind of understanding. But the reality when they, they realize this woman is with knowledge and with, within the tradition, within the classical jurisprudence, within the, the classical understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah, at that time, of course, uh, I guess the dialogue will take different avenue instead of, of uh, confrontation it will be more as uh, in harmony uh, more than. So thank you for the questions, very good. Thank you. Your Eminence, I see you scribbling. Do you have a final word for us? 
All right. Well, um, our panel today was really inspired by his eminent support for girls' education, and especially by the conference that he alluded to, Nigeria's National Conference on Islam and the Education of the Girl Child. When he spoke there, he said, it is imperative that we produce the Nana Asmaus of the 21st century. And I hope that today's panel has moved us a bit closer to that goal. Thank you all for joining us.